Uh, okay, welcome everyone to uh, our SAM virtual seminar series. Today, we are very happy to have Bob Scheimer presenting his joint work with Liang Jie Wu on diffusion on a sorted network. Today, we're also very happy to have many panelists joining us. Uh, so panelists, you, you will be able to uh, you know, ask live questions and discuss with Rob after the seminar uh, in the 15, 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, for attendees, if a question during uh, Rob's talk, uh, you can ask the questions in the Q&A window and Liang Jie will be answering them during uh, the presentation. And at the end, there will be a 15 minute uh, Q&A uh, session and you can ask also questions then and Rob will be able to answer them. Uh, so uh, also an, a few brief announcements. Uh, there'll be two events, uh, SAMF events in December. One is the SAMF over the counter market workshop in December the 3rd. And on December 13th, there will be another SAMF seminar by Pablo Otonello. Uh, okay, so let me stop sharing and Bob, I will hand you uh, the window. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for, uh, to everyone for coming here, uh, both panelists and other participants. This is uh, joint work with Liang Jie, who um, is on the, on the call, and we'll take the hard questions, uh, take the easy questions during the talk as well. It's a paper we've been working on for uh, probably over a year now, but this is actually the first time that I've presented it. Um, and, and it's a paper which is evolving. So I think that we circulate a version um, of the write-up, which was from March, um, and we're working on getting a new version circulated. You'll find that there's overlap, but not a lot of overlap between the circulated version and, and what's in the slides. Hopefully we've got some new and interesting results that clarify what's going on. Um, so what this paper is about is understanding how either knowledge or disease is, is circulated or transmitted through a network, and in particular through a network where there's some sort of sorting pattern, and in particular sorting patterns that respond to the uh, endogenous structure of the economy. That's what this paper is about. Uh, so we wanna think about a group of heterogeneous individuals uh, who interact endogenously and in contrast to a literature which already has that kind of structure where there's in individuals who choose say, their search intensity endogenously, we also wanna think about individuals who are choosing whom to interact with. And we'll think about two cases, a case of a disease where you have individuals, for example, who might be at high risk of dying from COVID versus low risk of dying from COVID. And a case of knowledge uh, where people might differ, for example, in how many contexts they have, how, how central they are to a network. Um, so some people are very popular, some people are unpopular. And you could have both these things in both cases. You could also have people with a lot of contacts in the disease case or people who benefit more from knowledge in the, in the knowledge case. Um, so a couple of different dimensions of heterogeneity and these two uh, opposite sign cases of disease and knowledge. What we wanna do in the paper is to think about diffusion in an equilibrium network, a network which arises um, it endogenously in response to heterogeneity in the return from, um, from knowledge or the, or the cost of getting sick and heterogeneity in contact rates. We'll think about two, uh, two main cases, one in which uh, individuals know their own infection status and know the infection status uh, or knowledge status of, of any partners that they have, and one which is the polar opposite where they don't know anything about their own infection status or the infection status of others. I'll try to remember to come back in the conclusion to mention why we don't think about yet about the intermediate case where it seems natural where you know your own infection status um, and don't know your partner's infection status. It's a, it's a harder problem uh, and some new issues arise. Um, and then individuals are gonna have choices about you know, when they should match in time and, and then also who they should match with. We're going to characterize equilibrium, the equilibrium allocation, and we're going to be particularly focused on two things. One is the sorting pattern that arises in equilibrium. So is it the case, for example, that people who are particularly high risk for a disease tend to match with other high risk people, which would be a form of positive sorting, uh, or the opposite? And secondly, 
how sorting affects the speed of diffusion of the disease or of knowledge. And we're gonna do this in, a, in several different uh, economic and information structures. So the information structures are about whether you know the, your own and other people's infection status. There's a large literature around this. Uh, let me say, um, I think except for Lucy Legu, uh, who is a panelist here, um, the other papers in here really don't think at all about um, the kind of sorting patterns which we're after in here. And her paper is different in a number of ways from what we're doing as well. So while there's a lot of studies of um, heterogeneous agent economies and networks, tends to be assumptions of, of an exogenous matching pattern within those networks. And so what we want to think about is endogeneity of who matches with whom and the impacts of that on diffusion. Okay, so I'm going to uh, give you an outline of what the talk is going to look like. And, um, and then I'll go through the three parts of the talk. So what we're going to do first is to explain the link between sorting patterns on a network and the speed of diffusion. And to do that, we're going to develop a model, very simple model with no economic decisions in it, in which uh, there's an exogenous network and we can vary the sorting pattern on the network and look at the speed of diffusion. And we'll show you how you can think about the reproduction number on that network as being a function of standard objects and also an index of homophily. And then we're going to move to two models in which we endogenize the network structure uh, to see how sorting arises in equilibrium, one of which people have known infection status um, and know, they know their own and others' infection status, and one in which there's unknown infection status. Okay, so first of all, the exogenous model. And, and as, as much as possible, we're going to keep these models notation and the structure of the models the same. There's some places it, which is in part a legacy or of, of older versions of this paper, and we haven't had time to update everything, where there's some small differences between them. I'll try to point out where the where differences we think are important and which differences we don't think are important. So everything's going to be in continuous time. Um, we're going to have an infinite horizon. We're going to have a measure one of individuals, and they're going to have names, uh, J, which are just uniformly distributed between zero and one. In everything we do here, we're going to look at, uh, the, we could potentially extend this to SIR type frameworks. We're going to be looking at a framework in which either individuals are either susceptible or infected. Um, and I'll use the kind of disease language, but this would be easy to state in terms of knowledge as well. So they either don't have information or they're, uh, they're informed. Um, and then there's going to be random matching. So the only difference, exogenous, oh, there's going to be two differences here. The one exogenous difference across individuals is how often they meet other people. So lambda j is going to be the rate at which a type j individual meets other people. <laughs> when a, a susceptible person and an infected person match together, I use meet and match interchangeably, which I shouldn't. When an infected person and susceptible person match together, <laughs> Infection is going to be transmitted. We could add a probability of transmission here, a knowledge transmission. We could add a probability of transmission. It's not going to add anything except for a free parameter to the model. So we'll, we'll keep that assumption without loss of generality throughout the talk. And then uh, at times we're going to work in a kind of SIS framework where infected people become susceptible again. Um, and that's one of the differences between models that we don't think is particularly material. Here, I'm going to assume that once you're infected, it's an absorbing state. So almost everyone is going to start off susceptible. A fraction epsilon of each type J are going to be infected at, at time zero. And then over time, we're going to get more and more infected people because infection is an absorbing state. It has to be increasing through time. So what happens here? This is a model of an exogenous network. And this is what the network looks like. When you meet somebody, who you meet is going to be dictated by this uh, cumulative distribution function. Whoops, this cumulative distribution function M. So MJK, which is going to be equal to M MKJ, tells you uh, essentially the share of meetings which are with a type uh, between two types uh, where one type is lower than J and the other type is lower than K. And remember, J and K are, are uniformly distributed between zero and one. So to the extent that MJK is not just kind of the, you know, it has a uniform density, that's going to tell you something about sorting patterns in the meeting, the matches that actually happen here. The number of matches that an individual has, lambda J, can just be read off of the partial derivatives of M. Uh, so if you evaluate MJK at K equal to one, 
and then uh, that gives you the number of matches where one type uh, index is less than J. And then the derivative of that with respect to J is the number of matches the type J has. And so that we're gonna, in some numerical thing I'll show you, we're gonna assume as a log normal distribution. Um, and then the part, we'll, we'll think of two polar cases. Case one, which will be in red in the figures that come up, uh, is gonna be a case with sorting. So with, and this will be perfect sorting. Whenever J meets somebody, who they're gonna meet is gonna be the same type as, as J. So people who have lots of meetings are gonna meet people who have lots of meetings, people who have few meetings are gonna meet people who have, who have few meetings. And case two is gonna be kind of a uniform random assumption. Who you meet is gonna be independent of your own type. So you're gonna to tend to meet people with lots of meetings at a high rate because those people have lots of meetings, but um, that's independent of whether your own type is, uh, is high or low. Um, and so that's something you can think of as, as random search. And um, what and is going to come up? Sorry, Can I ask a question? Of course. Sorry. So um, this is about the difference between matching and meeting. So this is about who you meet, not about yeah, this who is you actually, match. Yeah, so so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not being great on my language here. Here, we're, we're really not distinguishing a lot between matching and meeting. So the, those two I things see. are the same here. When we get to the next model, uh, to the endogenous models, then we're going to distinguish between meeting and matching. So okay. this is all about matching. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being bad yes. in my language there. Thanks for catching me on that. So all, everything I've said, let's say matching and meeting, all meetings are matches here. So it's not, there's no distinction. Later, we, we'll, we'll distinguish that, and that's important. Okay, so there's going to be sorting on infection probability that comes out of this model. Um, and how's that going to work? Individuals who have higher lambda Js, they have more matches. Um, and because they have more matches, they're going to tend to meet more infected people over time. So even though everyone starts off with an epsilon probability of being, of being infected, the individuals who have high lambda Js are going to wind up with higher infection probabilities over time. Eventually, everyone's going to be infected, but in, you know, at any finite point in time, the infection probability is going to be an increasing function of your lambda J. When they're sorting, that means that a lot of meetings are between two infected people. Two high lambda J people meet each other a lot. Um, and so they're likely to be infected. You get a lot of infected, infected needs. No disease is transmitted. When, uh, or alternatively, two low lambda J people meet each other. Um, and that's typically meetings between two susceptible people. So sorting tends to emphasize the number of meetings which are between people who can't transmit the disease between them or the knowledge between them. Whereas with random, uh, then you're equally likely to meet anybody. So that's going to be relative to the sorting benchmark. That's going to get you a lot of meetings between infected and susceptible people. Um, and so that means the difference in the pattern of, of whether infected people are meeting and matching with other infected people or with susceptible people, that's going to affect the speed of, of disease transmission. So how does sorting wind up mattering for diffusion? I'm going to illustrate this through a numerical example. And you know, we used to have numbers telling you what the parameters were, but it's not something that I want you to take seriously numerically. So I, we even removed the numbers which, which gave you this. But these are those two polar cases, sorting where you only meet exactly your own type and random search where you're meeting equally likely to meet all uh, types conditional on a, or match with all types conditional on, on having a meeting. Okay, so what happens uh, in those two polar cases? When you have random search, sorry, well, let me take the black line first. When you have perfect sorting, early on, you get a faster transmission of the disease because the high lambda people are the people who uh, have lots of meetings. Very few of them, like very few of everybody else, are infected, uh, but they transmit the disease to other high lambda people who then pass it on to other high lambda people at a high rate. So the disease quickly goes through the high lambda population. But after a while, you're left with a group of people who have low infection rates and low meeting rates. And those are the people who remain to get infected. And so with a lot of sorting, the disease transmission then starts to, to slow down. Whereas with random search, uh, you get the a random uh, matching, you get that the disease transmission is a little bit slower at first because some of the disease is transmitted by the high lambda people goes to other low lambda people who don't have a lot of meetings but then it transmits more efficiently through the network. So you get a speed up in the transmission later, uh, later on. Uh, oh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So I'm thinking all the, all the time about, uh, suppose there are people with, who are vaccinated, 
so I guess then you would have high meetings, low susceptibility context, right? So that will be very different or you, you can also postpone. Yeah, so I, I don't have anything about vaccines in here. I think the I, I think this would require a, a third state that we're not going to have, which would be something like a you know, recovered state. So I think that's typically the way you would model vaccines is moving people from the susceptible state to the recovered state. I'm going to try to state things in ways where I think the basic properties still hold when we add the recovered state, but we haven't investigated that as, as seriously. So maybe we can speculate on that later on, um, on, on how that would affect things. Uh, but I think that, you know, the basic force, which I'm emphasizing here, which is that sorting means early on, the infected people are passing on to other infected people who are transmitting quickly, but then it gets through that population quickly. So think about, you have a bunch of high school students who pass diseases on very rapidly, and it goes through the whole high school very quickly. But my parents who are sitting at home through the disease, um, you know, they're, they're have a low lambda. Uh, and as long as they're only meeting other low lambda people, it's going to be a long time before the disease gets to them. That's the basic point, which is which is here in the sorting network. Whereas if they were my parents were meeting high school students as fast as they were meeting other eighty year olds, um, then it would look more like the red line, and it would get through to the, the disease would get through to them much much faster, slower slower initial transmission, but then faster. Okay, so what we argue is that you can a, a useful decomposition of the effective reproduction number. I'm assuming by now that everyone knows what the effective reproduction number is. Essentially, it's the growth rate of the disease, the uh, growth rate of infections. Uh, it can be decomposed into basic reproduction number, which is what would happen um, basically at the initial instant, times the product of, of three terms. One, the last term, um, is the sort of standard herd immunity term, which is the number of people who are susceptible. The second to last term is a term that we call the aggregate amount of activity. And I think it's a little bit of a stretch here to call it aggregate activity, but it's picking up the same phenomenon, which is in a, you know, a lot of macroeconomic epidemiological models, uh, which is that depending on the average number of meetings among the susceptible and infected populations, that affects the transmission of the disease. Now here it's not coming because people are being cautious about their the number of meetings that they have, that's all exogenous. It's coming about because you're left with a, for example, susceptible population, which has very, very low levels of activity. Um, and so this is just a total amount of activity, but there's nothing about sorting, which is going on in that term. And the new term is our homophily index, HT. Um, and the homophily index is defined as something essentially proportional to well, uh, one plus something like the covariance uh, on the matching network between the infected rate of type J and the susceptible rate of their partners K. So when we measure these covariances and these expectations over M, these are measured with respect to the, the matching network. Um, and so to the extent that infected people tend to meet susceptible people, we're going to get that the homophily index is bigger than one. If infected people tend to meet other infected people, the homophily index will be smaller than one. If there's positive sorting on infection status, uh, then we're going to get the infected people tend to meet susceptible, uh, sorry, tend to meet other infected people. They don't meet other susceptible people. This covariance is negative and the homophily index is going to be, uh, is going to be less than one. And that's what's happening in this figure with sorting, so it's slowing down the diffusion of the, um, of the disease here is with sorting, you get an X, I'll show you what that looks like here. This is the homophily index with sorting. And so that pushes down the transmission of the disease. And it's because after the initial phase of the disease, once it is built up to, to reasonable numbers, most of the meetings are already between people who are already infected with other infected people, high lambda people, or susceptible people and susceptible people low lambda people, and that slows down the transmission of the disease. Rob, can I just briefly ask you? Um, so this part is super clear for the late part, but how does your formula capture the first part where it's actually quicker? It must come then through the activity index? Yeah, it's coming, through the, it? it's coming through the activity part. So what the activity part is measuring, so IT is the total number of infected people, and expectation under M of I is whether a typical meeting that you have um, is with an infected person or not. So it's a difference between whether the average person is infected or whether the average meeting is with an infected person. And so it's that inflation of activity early on, which works in the other direction. Oh. I have to think about it more, yeah. 
Okay, thank yeah, you. But you, you, under, you understand conceptually the difference between who the average person is and who the average meeting is with. Um, and AT is, that's what, that's what those ratios are picking up. Okay, so uh, I think the, the, I'll say here, well, we'll, we'll come to the model with an endogenous uh, matching. And I think that the AT will also be a little bit clearer to understand in, in, that, in that environment. So let me come to that now. So our main analysis, we wanna think about, you know, what is it that determines that capital M that I had before, who matches with whom? And so we want an environment where people are making decisions about, about who to match with. So why did my parents hide at home and not go to high school parties? I mean, they weren't going to a lot of high school parties before the pandemic, but they certainly didn't go to a lot of high school parties during the, the pandemic. Um, and so we wanna understand that, uh, that kind of decision. So we're gonna study an environment in which people know their own infection status and know other people's infection status as well. So let me describe this environment. Again, continuous time, it's gonna run forever. We're gonna have individuals who have types J, again, these are just names uniformly distributed between zero and one. Everyone's gonna have a discount rate R and they're gonna differ in one way, uh, which is their utility or disutility that they get when they're infected. So we're gonna think about phi J as being the utility you get when you're infected. So in the case of a disease, phi J is gonna be a negative number more negative Fijs, it's a worse consequence of, of, of having the disease. Fij positive is the case of knowledge, more valuable to, uh, to have the knowledge. And we'll normalize your flow utility to zero while you're susceptible. That's the only source of exogenous heterogeneity in this model. Um, how should I think about knowledge in terms of susceptible, in fact, as susceptible? So if it's um, information, yeah, so, so here, we, could, we could shut this down. And this is where we're moving back and forth. It, we do have here, they become susceptible again. So you could think of, you know, rate delta, you just, you lose that knowledge, you forget about it. Just true. I, I think I worked on a few years ago. I don't remember very well. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, it needs to be refreshed periodically in order to, to keep that knowledge. Um, alternatively, I, I think everything we're doing, we're not studying steady states. Um, so, I don't think it's essential for anything we talk about here that we even have a positive value of delta. Alternatively, we could introduce a positive value of delta elsewhere um, in, the, in, the, in the model. Uh, Rob, um, another yep. a question, which is maybe a little boring. So if you don't have any, any exogenous heterogeneity, do you get exposed heterogeneity? Uh, exposed heterogeneity through infection status, but we're going to be interested in whether there's sorting on things like fee, so we wouldn't have much to say about that. And we, could, we could, you'll see, I mean, it's a special case of the model, fee J, okay. I'll show you what results come out when fee okay. J. Um, okay, so now I want to really emphasize the difference between meeting and matching. I'll try, uh, here, it's really important to get my language straight. So meetings are going to be at the same rate, at rate lambda. Everyone's going to meet somebody at rate lambda. And that's going to be random and uniform across types. When you meet someone, you're going to determine the idiosyncratic value of that meeting. And that's some valuation which is independent of the disease. So, uh, you know, think about this, this maybe is easier to think about some of the older literature around HIV. You know, there's, there's particular people where it's, you want to take a risk and, and you're, you're willing to take a risk of, of that meeting, and other people that you, you, know, you wouldn't take the risk even if there was no risk. Uh, so, there's some value new that you get if this meeting is, is consummated. Um, it's drawn from a distribution F. Um, and then individuals are going to observe their own new, and they're going to know their own infection status and observe their partner's infection status and decide whether to undertake the meeting or not. Now, the meeting's only going to happen, sorry, the match is only going to happen if both people agree to the match. This will be a non transferable utility environment. So, you know, if I'm willing to, to write a paper with Marion with, with probability 0.5 and she's willing to write a paper with me with probability 0.5, the paper's gonna get written with probability 0.25. The two news are independent draws from F. And so there will be an endogenous probability of a match between J and K at time T, which is QJKT is a probability that J agrees to a match with K at time T and QKJT is probably that K agrees to a match with J at time T. We're gonna again start with epsilon people who are infected and we're gonna have transmission of the disease with probability one whenever a match actually happens. If you have a meeting and you reject the match, then there's no risk of transmission. 
Um, and as I noted in answer to Anna, uh, this will be an SIS model. So infected people can become susceptible again, uh, but we could shut down Delta. It's not gonna, it's not gonna matter for what we have. So if you don't like that, set Delta equal to zero. Okay, so if there were no concerns about disease in this model, uh, then individuals would, uh, they get utility new when they accept the match, they get zero when they don't accept the match. So the rule would be very simple. If new is positive, you take the match. If new is negative, you reject the match. So you would accept a match if new is positive with probability one minus F of, of zero. Um, the interesting trade-off is if I'm susceptible and I meet somebody who I know is infected, remember we know other people's infection status, do I take that match or not? So it's clear uh, equilibrium is gonna involve a threshold. Uh, you're gonna accept any match where the idiosyncratic valuation is above some threshold, ZJT. And therefore the acceptance probability is gonna be one minus ZJT. So ZJT is going to be taken as given as, ca as capital ZJT is gonna be taken as given as the probability that if you're infected, you meet a type J person who's susceptible, that's the probability that they'll uh, accept a match with you. And then we're going to be interested in studying the evolution of infection rates. We'll call that little IJT for type I, sorry, for type J, and the aggregate infection rate, IT, which is just the average infection rate in the population. Rob, I guess here it does matter that you assume that um, the, the disease transmits with probability one. So I can see that in the other one, change, it was just a constant. It very little. Lambda okay. is basically, you would, if you had a beta naught or something, which is a disease transmission probability, Everywhere you see a lambda, replace it with lambda times beta naught. That's what happens. Um, so basically, you have these. I mean, it changes the decision rule a tiny bit, but that's what I wanted to say. It yeah, but, really but, messes but, but around it just, with it. Just you know, what becomes relevant is the meetings where the where the disease transmission actually happens. Um, so it'll you know, like it, it'll probably it'll be a couple other places will be beta naught floating around, but it's just going to be kind of this nuisance parameter that's floating around as well. Um, and, so and it's a, let's say it's an easy it's an easy extension. Does it matter that you observe the infection status? Yeah, so we'll come back and talk about unknown infection status. I can tell you, I'll, I'll tell you now, well, I'll tell you later why we, why we don't do the intermediate case, but we're gonna look at, it, it definitely matters that you know the infection status and we'll give you the characterization where you don't know. Um, so we have a couple of value functions now. The, this is the, the first one is the value of an individual who's susceptible, um, whose type is J and it's at time T. So what happens, the flow value of that individual, it comes from a couple of different types of meetings that the person might have. At rate lambda, uh, the individual is going to meet somebody who is infected. Um, and that's a, a fraction of IT of the population. And then with probably one minus F of zero, that infected person would potentially accept the, meet, the match with you. Then you have to decide whether to accept the match with them. So what you're gonna do is set a threshold, little z, big Z is their threshold, little z is your threshold. You set a threshold, little z, you accept any matches which are above little z. And when you accept a match, you get the payoff new from that match, but you switch because you assume it's probability one that you get infected, you switch from to the infected state instead of being susceptible. So you get a capital gain of new plus vi minus vs. And you integrate that across the F distribution using some optimally chosen threshold z. And you know, jump down to this bullet point here, you can see immediately the optimal threshold Z is just gonna be the difference between the valuation of being susceptible versus infected. When you're, uh, when you're susceptible, you can also meet other susceptible people. When you meet other susceptible people, both of you know the other one's susceptible. They're gonna accept the meeting with probability one minus F of zero. They'll accept it if their value is above zero. And your valuation is gonna be the value you get for a typical new that's above zero. Uh, so that's that's the subject here. And then there's the fact that the value of being susceptible might change over time just because the aggregate state is changing over time. Once you're infected, um, you get a flow payoff of phi. This is the cost of infection, negative if it's a disease, positive if it's knowledge. At rate lambda, you meet another infected people. And now this is kind of like two susceptible people meeting. When two infected people meet, they don't worry about uh, disease transmission. So the, the other person accepts it's probably one minus F of zero. You get the, the meeting if it's, uh, um, if it's positive nu, you get the value of nu. The interesting part is what happens down in the second line here. At rate lambda, you meet uh, somebody 
And this term and this first integral describes the probability that that person is susceptible and they're willing to match with you. So for them to be willing to match with you, they have to have a realization which is above the equilibrium threshold capital ZJT. Um, and so you have see people are turning down matches with you because you're infected. And then you're willing to still accept because you're infected, you don't mind matching the susceptible people, you accept anything that's above zero. If you allowed for recovery, you would be changing what happened when you met another infected person? Is that this is it, uh, Susan, it's right here. The delta term is when you allow for recovery. So recovery, um, uh, every, delta, every delta, you go back to the susceptible state. That's it. Okay. Uh, so you, you don't take into account that you're, you're not less likely to recover if you meet an infected person. No, well, no, but yeah, I can't, yeah. So that, I mean, you could think about something where being in, reinfected while you're already sick is uh, can prolong the disease. Okay. That, okay. Yeah, we'd have to keep track of how many infections you have or complicate the development equation. I think mm -hmm. you could you could handle something like that potentially, but given the exponential decay, um, you know, it resets your clock to zero, but it's a it's a memoryless process, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, that's uh, what I, that was sort of what I had in mind. Like, yeah, yeah, but you, yeah, you need to get away from the memoryless process, kind of the typical SI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the capital gain term because time is changing. So the optimization tells you, that, as I said, that your threshold is just the difference between the value of being susceptible and the value of being infected. And that's something we call your, your caution. This determines how cautious you are. I don't sometimes say precautious. Um, so how cautious or precautious you are um, depends on how much worse it is to be infected. And you can uh, just subtract the two Bellman equations at the top of the slide to get an equation in terms of little z. And I'm going to use in this slide, I'm also going to use the fact that in equilibrium, big Z equals little z. Uh, so individual take big Z as given, but in equilibrium, big Z is equal to little z. And so we get down to just a single equation for little z. There's two new objects in here, but they're just functions of f. So q of z is 1 minus f of z. It's the probability that when you set a threshold z that you accept the match. And w of z is the gain from a match when you have a threshold, when you have a, a cost Z from that match, um, you're choosing the optimal threshold. Uh, so we get, a, we get this equation that determines Z um, and the difference between the value being susceptible and infected. And it's got kind of three terms in it plus the capital gain term. One is when you're, when you're sick, you're sick. Uh, so you, you suffer from, from the disease. And then we got two terms which have to do with changes in matching behavior. So one term is that when you're susceptible, you're turning down matches with infected people. Uh, and that reduces your utility. You're taking, you're setting your, you're being cautious and setting a positive value of new and therefore rejecting some matches that have, that have positive value to you because you want to avoid getting sick. Uh, that's the difference in valuation here. And then there's a second term, which is once you're sick, other people who are susceptible are being cautious and rejecting matches with you. And so you're losing some matches as well. Um, and so both of those things lead to differences in the valuation between being susceptible and being cautious. And so that's an equation for, uh, for Z given a value of um, the little i's and the big i's. And then an equilibrium is just that Bellman equation for Z as well as the equation for the evolution of individual infection statuses and the aggregate infection status, which you could write in terms of the effective reproduction number for the disease. Uh, I realize there's a lot of, of a lot of math in, in, in here, and so like absorbing exactly what these equations are, you're probably not doing in, in real time. Uh, Rob, can I briefly ask you? But, but, but the basic concept of, kind of what an equilibrium looks like, I don't think is very complicated here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just to get this, did we just get rid of all the value functions when you did this, or are no, they still the, floating the Z around is, somewhere? Z is the difference in the value functions. I see, and you, but. Okay, so you basically summarize the whole difference in this difference, okay. I yeah, see. exactly. So all, all that winds up matter, you can, you can express everything just in terms of the difference. You don't need to keep track of the individual value. Sure. Uh, which of course makes sense because you can't affect, like you're in this economy, there's no participation or something like that. So all that really matters is the difference between being susceptible and infected. I think that's a fairly standard in, in models without a participation margin. Sure. So that's the difference that matters difference between the value of being employed versus unemployed. And we see that all the time. That's kind of what matters. Um, okay, so that's what that's what an equilibrium looks like. So let me talk to you about some results about sorting. I'll get to sorting actually in just a second. So the first uh, lemma, which I think is, is super intuitive, is 
phi one is bigger than phi two. So in the disease case, this means phi one is the teenagers, phi two is my parents. In the knowledge case, you know, phi one, the people are really value the, the information, phi two, they value it less. Uh, that implies that at any point in time, I'll say in terms of disease, you know, teenagers are more likely to be infected than my parents. And teenagers are going to set, if they are still susceptible, are going to set a lower threshold. They're being more willing to match with infected people than my parents who are going to be more, more cautious at a higher threshold, see. So I don't think it's, it's uh, you know, makes sense that you get something like that out. And then the results of that is we're going to get some results about sorting patterns and therefore the speed of diffusion. So to talk about sorting, I have to define what sorting is. And I think this is, there's different definitions you could use. Uh, this is a stronger notion of sorting than just a positive correlation. It implies a positive correlation. But let's think of any attribute X. X could be the type of the individual or their, you know, um, their fee. It could be the, um, their infection status. And so we'll use it in, in both ways. We'll say that, that the equilibrium is possibly sorted on X. If for any X1 bigger than X2, the distribution of partners of X1, which is some M of X prime given X1, first order stochastically dominates the distribution of partners of X2. So for example, if X1 is, is infected people and X2 is susceptible people, then we'll say there's positive sorting on infection. If infected people have relatively more infected partners compared to susceptible, compared to the ratio of infected to susceptible for, type, for the susceptible people. And there's negative sorting if it's the opposite. So what comes out, we can compute the, for infected people, the share of their matches that are with other infected people. And we can do the same for susceptible people. And this just comes out from the thresholds that different types are setting. And what you can prove, um, again, without going through these expressions, but you can prove that the infected people are relatively more likely to match with infected people compared to how likely susceptible people are, if and only if this inequality holds. This is an integral. One minus i is the number is the share of j's that are susceptible. So that's always positive. So all we need to look at is the second term in parentheses here. Zjt is the threshold, the caution of type j people. Higher z means lower q. So the main question is going to be for zj for q zjt to be less than q zero. That means that uh, individuals are going to have to set a positive value for z. When do they set a positive value for Z? That's the disease case. So in the case with the, where this is a disease, susceptible people are gonna be cautious, try to avoid matching with infected people. And so disproportionately many matches are going to be between susceptibles and susceptibles or infected and infected and susceptible infected matches are less frequent. So we get a positive sorting on infection. In the knowledge case, when you're susceptible, you know, you're sitting at the bar next to somebody who knows a lot, um, a kind of a boring person. You wouldn't want to talk to them except for they might impart their knowledge on you. Um, and so you put up with the knowledge and there's disproportionately many matches between susceptible and infected people uh, in that case. And therefore with knowledge, there's negative sorting on infection. So this model very naturally gets you either positive or negative sorting, um, depending on whether we're talking about the disease or the, or the knowledge case. Um, so what about the relation between infection and cost? At any point in time, if, again, I'll say this in terms of disease case, you can say in terms of knowledge, uh, you know, teenagers have a lower cost of disease than my parents do. Phi one is bigger than phi two. That means that teenagers are going to set a lower threshold and they're going to have a higher infection rate. Uh, and that means that there's a monotone mapping between the phi j's and the i's. Um, IJTs preserving sorting. So we also get sorting based on, on cost. So the high cost, if, um, if we're in the disease case where all the fee J's are negative, then we're going to have positive sorting on fee. People who have teenagers will tend to go to parties with teenagers. My parents, to the extent they saw anybody, would, would hang out with other, uh, with other old people. In the knowledge case, it's going to be the opposite again. The low cost people sorry, the, the low benefit people are going to be kind of the last ones to learn the information. And they're gonna be in the end willing to put up with sitting at a bar with a high, um, with a person who has a high benefit for the knowledge 
because they that person is being more likely to be knowledgeable. They know that person's knowledgeable, they're more likely to be knowledgeable and get that information. So we get a, ne a negative sorting on the fees. Um, so and so for, for the infection case, so, so the elderly typically also face other hazards. So that's not in your model, but it's so, so an extreme case, right? If you know you're only gonna live for two more years, you may also be willing to take a lot more risk. That's a good point. Yeah, so you could model differences in discount rates or other, you know, as a way to as a way to pick that up. And I, I guess there will be some sort of race between those two things. Um, so because you get an immediate benefit from the meeting and a cost of the disease later on, and, and um, yeah, I think you're completely right. So one thing we could certainly do is to think about just differences in R. Um, and I'm guessing you would get sorting based on R. Um, and then if there's you know, differences in R and fee that are correlated with each other, presumably it's gonna depend on which effect is stronger. But that's a, that's a great point. Can I ask, uh, is, should there be more or less sorting compared to in equilibrium compared to the efficient, like socially efficient level of sorting? Um, yeah, so we've done some work on, on this. There's a number of differences between them. Can I hold off on that? Because I'm gonna speculate a bit. I, I don't think we actually have efficiency results in, in this case, but I'll, I will try to come back and say something about efficiency. Um, I'm also not sure we can say more or less sorting necessarily. Like that, that statement might not be something we get with the language to answer. Um, but there is there are inefficiencies that we could talk about. Okay, so let me just show you the um, the reproduction number now. Break down between those three terms H A and S. Lambda over delta is the basic reproduction number here. Uh, S is just the number of people who are not infected. A, I think, looks more like something to be comfortable with talking about what A is. So A is the fraction of meetings that turn into matches. Um, and that's going to be, say, in the disease case, reduced. We'll think about reduced activity, not because you have fewer meetings, but because fewer of them are consummated into matches to the extent that ZJT is positive, now that people are rejecting some of those meetings. And then HT, and so this is kind of the term that's gotten a lot of attention in the macro epidemiolo epidemiology literature, the AT term. Uh, the endogenous precautions because of the disease. The new part is this term here um, on HT. Uh, and HT is picking up, uh, in general, is picking up this covariance, but here it actually just boils down because um, the relevant question is whether susceptible people are willing to match with infected people who they know are infected. It actually just boils down to a covariance term between individuals' infection status and their threshold Z. And bec uh, because of that, actually, for both the infected in the, both the case of knowledge and the case of disease, it turns out that HT is less than one, as long as there's any heterogeneity in the economy, as long as the fees are not degenerate, um, then we're going to get HT equal to one. So, Miriam, this is kind of this is what would come out of this model. If we made the fees degenerate, you would still get the AT out, uh, but the HT term would collapse to, to one. Uh, so given that you get back to it, can I ask a question? So. Here was, I think this is the right uh, way I had to say, tell my question. So right now you are assuming heterogeneity is in phi, okay? Assume heterogeneity is in lambda, just assume it, okay? And then you would get still, I guess, sorting and a cutoff rule. Yeah, uh, so for reasons that are historical legacies, and I don't think have good, Larry may, may correct me and say there's a good reason for this, but in this part of the paper, we assume there's only heterogeneity in phi. Um, in the next part of the paper, we have both heterogeneity and phi and lambda. And so I think our, our aim is to add the heterogeneity and lambda back in here. There's some cases where it, there's some things that are hard to talk about when you have both types of heterogeneity, same as the R I just talked about, but- Right, I, so I, I just want to keep it at one type. Meetings and old people all the time. So they might have higher lambda and a lower cost of disease, for example. As, exactly, so I just want to keep one heterogeneity. So let's just, call, or like if phi, let's assume there is only heterogeneity in phi, can you, Allow the, if you allow the agents to choose their fee at some cost, will you get a, and the matching probability and, and the match? Yeah, and there's these. Um, yeah, I don't know what it means decision. to choose. Fee. So I don't want to. I mean, keep you, you, you can obviously system. add in mechanically. Uh, Miriam, I think um, we're, you warned us at the beginning you, we might lose you because of your phone, um, and uh, we've lost you at an inopportune moment. Um, so I'll, I'll try to say what I think she was saying, because Miriam and I have worked on papers where individuals are choosing things like their contact rates. Um, 
So one could certainly think about that here. I don't exactly know what's going to come out. Um, it's, a, it, it's an interesting question on choice of, of contact rates, but we want to emphasize the, the endogeneity here is not how often you meet people. Those are sort of potentially determined from just from the random search process. But the, there's still a choice about when you meet somebody, you know, how closely do you interact with that person? That's, the, that's what the Z is doing. So here you see somebody who's, you know, it's obviously sick and you stay away from them. Um, the meeting is attractive enough, you might be willing to, to meet with them. But that obviously raises the question about, well, you know, what if you can't tell whether people are sick or not? So now we want to go to the other extreme. We want to go to an environment where people, where you don't know people's infection status. And the thing you're expecting me to do now is to assume that you know your own infection status and you don't know other people's infection status. That's not what we're going to do. That's a hard model. I'll tell you now why it's a harder model. We've thought, we've thought a lot about it, but it's, it's a harder model because now it's a signaling game um, if you made that assumption. If you assume that you know your own infection status and not other people's infection status, then the fact that you're willing to match with me tells me something about your infection status. Miriam, I answered your question brilliantly while you were offline. We, we'll talk more about it later. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. Um, so... Um, if I, if, if I don't know your infection status, but you know it, the fact that you're willing to match with me would tell me something about your infection status, and that can create multiple equilibria for sort of standard signaling game issues, and we're trying to avoid that. So what we'll do is go to the opposite extreme, uh, which is that you don't know either your own infection status or other people's infection status. So this is a disease which is kind of hidden from you, and we'll capture this uh, by assuming that there's a fine horizon uh, of unknown duration. So think of a game which ends uh, according to a Poisson process with a rival rate R. And at the end of the game, you're going to learn whether you're infected or not and suffer a loss if you were infected. Um, so that's the, um, the way we're gonna model symmetric lack of information. So again, measure one of individuals. Um, you meet people, now we have a lambda J um, and I think we could have had a lambda J before. So you meet people at a rate, uh, we'll call it, just call it lambda j. The rate of meeting a k is proportional to k's meeting rate. So this keeps these meetings uh, consistent with each other. So you more likely you meet people at a faster rate who have, who have more meetings. When these meetings occur, um, there's a mistake on this slide. I got too ambitious with my copying. This part's wrong. Um, so, when these meetings occur, you each draw a value nu and you decide whether to form the match um, after observing nu and observing the other person's uh, type, J, but not observing, their, uh, not observing their actual infection status. And so that again is gonna give rise to matching probabilities uh, where the probability that J accepts a match with K at time T times probably that K accepts a match with J at time T. And again, non-transferable utility. And now we're back to infection being permanent. I'm sure we could add a delta back into this model um, and make it into an SIS model. As I said, there's some small differences between the two models, which are historical legacies and, and things that I think we can fix. Rob, can I ask you two questions? Sure. Uh, one is, um, is there a particular reason why you dropped the phi j's and now work with the difference in lambda j's? Makes it a little bit... Or... They're here, they're here. Oh, they're still there. Okay, now yeah, they can all. We added the lambda j's. Perfect. Okay, and the other part is I didn't quite understand exactly whether updating here plays a role or it doesn't because you only get paid at the very end or kind of. Yeah, that, so there's, there's an assumption we're making which I'm a, a little uneasy with, which is I assume that um, individuals. The assumption we have is that individuals belief about their own infection status is the same as all type, you know, if you're a type J, it's the same as all type J's belief about their infection status. So it's almost like you don't even know how, how many meetings you've had in the past. Um, I think the right way to do this, and we really have to change the, the write up to, to reflect this, is to think about, there's just a constant flow of risk that you have. You take the subway every day. You could wear a mask when you're on the subway and reduce your risk, but it's not like that there's a moment when a guy coughs in your face and you say, oh my God, this might be really bad. Um, 
my infection probability is discreetly changed. It's just a constant flow of these things, which is which is happening. Um, and what you're looking at it, it, um, is is the mitigation strategies that you undertake. So let's look at those mitigation strategies. But but this can change over time. Just just to it will understand. change over time. Absolutely, it will change over time. Yep. Right. And so, but so in your current version, you don't update what you yourself do, but what everybody else is doing. Is that yeah, kind of how it works? Exactly. Although you recognize, yeah. So let me let me show you what the Bellman equations look like, and we'll talk we'll talk about what what it represents. I think this this sort of continuous time version of it, the continuous meetings version of it, I think will be a, a, probably a better interpretation. Um, an internally consistent interpretation. So when you meet somebody, you have to decide whether to match with them. You're going to set a threshold. Um, and again, the threshold can be time dependent and it can be type dependent of the type of your, of your partner. Uh, if that threshold is Z, it gives rise to an acceptance probability Q, which is one minus F of Z. It's going to be useful just to invert that function. So if we know your acceptance probability, we can find your, your threshold Z. Your expected utility from those matches we'll call omega of Q. And that's just the expected value of realizations of eta that exceed Z of Q. Uh, Z of Q is F inverse of one minus Q. Um, and so this is when you're choosing sort of a, caution, a level of caution Q, this is the, the utility you're getting from your, uh, from your matches. So at rate lambda, you get utility omega Q if the other person's accepting the matches with you. Um, so omega has certain properties. You can start differentiating it. It's gonna be equal to zero when, you have, when you're rejecting all matches, you get no utility from the matches. It's increasing and it's concave. And so an alternative inter interpretation of this is depending on the level of precaution that you have, uh, you, know, you walk around in a hazmat suit, you're taking a tremendous amount of precaution and you get very, you know, a very low chance of getting sick but you also get very little utility from life, or you can just be out there, you know, seize the day, uh, very little precaution and get more utility with this diminishing returns to, to precaution. So I think that would be, that's an alternative interpretation of what, of what Q is. Um, the level of caution that you have can be dependent on, on who you're interacting with at that moment. So your actual infection status is unknown. And as I said, you get a terminal payoff when the economy ends, which is phi j. So rate R, the economy ends, you get a payoff of Vj at that point, and again, negative for disease, positive for knowledge, and zero if you're uninfected. Okay, so equilibrium characterization. This is the problem that the individuals have. And what I wanna do is to think about this first term, this match payoff term, instead of being something that you get at, at the moments of the matches, it's being kind of a constant diffusion of payoffs you get depending on the cues that you're choosing. So let me explain it. You get a payoff over an infinite future, discounted at rate R because of the chance that the economy comes to an end. At the moment, with probably R e to the minus RT, the economy comes to an end at, at time T, you get a payoff of phi J times the probability that you're infected at time T. Prior to that, if the economy hasn't come to an end, at rate lambda J, you meet, you meet a lambda J lambda K, you meet a, a lambda K person. That person accepts the match with probability QKJT. And your expected utility from the match when you set a threshold of little qjkt is omega of little qjkt. So that's that integral from the right from, um, back here. Then your choice of little q, as well as others' choice of big Q and their infection status, that affects your likelihood of the evolution of your infection status. So your infection probability increases to the extent that you're susceptible, that you meet somebody where you accept the match, probability QJKT, they accept the match, QKJT, and that person is infected. And then you've got some initial, uh, should be J comma zero and subscript IJ zero equal to epsilon. Um, and so what you wanna do is to choose a uh, path for your QJKTs, your little QJKTs, uh, which is your acceptance probability of all the different matches at all the different points in time, uh, which will then determine your infection status in order to maximize your expected utility over the infinite future, taking as given um, the behavior of other people and taking as given the fraction of, of others that are infected. Equilibrium is going to be the individuals choose optimally taking as given the behavior of others, and that there's consistency uh, between the big Qs and little Qs and big eyes and little eyes. 
Okay, so to solve this problem, what we do is break it into two pieces. The first thing I do is to find a new object called beta JT. And beta JT is just defined in the second constraint here. And it's the same problem I wrote down before. Now, what's nice about writing the problem down this way is if you look where little q appears, it appears in the time t term of the objective function. And it appears in this equation for beta JT. It doesn't appear anywhere else. So taking as given beta JT, which is how fast your infection rate is rising, we could ask the question, how do you want to distribute the matches that you have across different types k. And that's the first question, who do you match with? So um, you get some utility from matching given beta JT, which is I dot over one minus I, I dot over S. The utility you get from matching at that point in time is given by the objective function. And you face a constraint that your increase in I has to be consistent with that beta, which is written down here. And that's this expression here. And that's a static optimization problem. We'll solve this by sticking a Lagrange multiplier, CJT, onto that constraint. And from the envelope condition, CJT should be the marginal value to J at time T of an additional unit of speeding up their infection. Um, and that's, again, what we call caution. So if you want to be, if you're very cautious, uh, you're going to be very cautious when the marginal value of, of uh, infection is, is, um, is high. Okay, so we have a static decision, which comes out immediately from this problem, which is given any value of beta t, uh, the optimal matching decision satisfies the probability of matching with k at time t. It's just the product of this caution that you're choosing um, times the infection rate of k's at time t. Um, and that's a, that's a property of an optimal control. So for a given level of caution, you want to match less with people who have a higher probability of being infected. If you're more cautious, you want to match less with everybody. And then the second part of the problem is the dynamic problem. Given, um, given the first static part, which comes out of here, the objective function can be just rewritten as WJT of beta JT plus the terminal payoff and infections increases in, in this way. And now, We've eliminated all the k's from here. This is just a, a J-specific problem about deciding how to increase their infection rate, how much additional infections will allow. You could stop all the increase in infections by setting beta JT equal to zero, but then you get very little payoff from, from W. Um, in fact, you would get zero payoff from W. So the, the k's are hiding inside the, the other people are hiding inside this capital W term. And the solution that comes out of that is that your caution CJT, remember CJT was the marginal of the spec, uh, I'm pointing at my screen now, CJT is equal to W prime of beta JT. Um, and so CJT, which is W prime of beta JT, turns out to be equal to the product of two terms. One is minus phi J, minus your return. And the other is the probability that when time comes to an end, you're still susceptible. And so how cautious you wanna be, um, depends on if you're very unlikely to be susceptible at the end of time, then there's no reason to be cautious today. But if when time comes to an end, you expect to be, uh, you expect to still be susceptible, then you're going to, um, to be more cautious. And then if, if you, if it's very painful to be, uh, to get sick, you're also going to be more cautious. Okay. So Higher values of caution, and from the, from the terms I showed you before, I think I said this already, higher values of caution implies lower matching probabilities, higher infected uh, partners imply lower matching probabilities. When phi j is negative from this expression from the lemma, your caution is gonna be positive, you're gonna reject some positive matches. When phi j is positive, the knowledge case, your caution is negative, <coughs> and that means you're going to accept some matches which are negative because it gives you a chance of learning something. It's basically one o'clock now, and I have a few more things I want to go. So I'll probably run about five minutes over. It's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then other things, I think I've said everything, which most of what's on here. Um, the last point I think is, uh, is also interesting. As you can see from this equation, that because infection status is increasing over time, or infection probability is increasing over time in the SI model, uh, your caution has to be decreasing over time. 
So over time, eventually people are going to say, you know, I know eventually I'm going to get infected. There's very little chance I'm going to stay healthy um, even in the near future. And so even my parents would give up on being, uh, on being cautious eventually. Okay, so equilibrium is then characterized by this equation for caution and an SI dynamics. And, and this is the, the case with, with uh, private information. Sorting patterns are basically determined by what happens in this term here. So let's look at the in, in SI dynamics. Infection increases to the extent you're susceptible, you meet somebody of type K, and then these one minus F terms, that's the probability that I accept a match with, K, that J accepts a match with K and K accepts a match with J. Um, and so the extent of sorting is gonna be determined by, by those terms and they enter nicely, nice and symmetric. Um, and so I'll talk about what happens on, on sorting. So basically from that expression, we get that there's positive sorting on infection status. If for all values of nu, J, K, and T, the following inequality holds. So first of all, we have this term in blue where alpha is the hazard rate of the distribution of the idiosyncratic shock nu. Um, and that's something which in principle could be, could be positive or negative. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, later on. It depends on, it's a distributional assumption. Um, and then I think Pareto is the borderline case where it's, where it's equal to zero. Um, and then um, it depends on whether people with higher infection status are also more cautious or, or less cautious. Uh, so that's kind of a reduced form object. We'll translate this into more interesting things. So for this slide, I'll say condition A is satisfied if you have types who have, let's talk about the disease case, types who have more meetings, teenagers, also have a lower cost to the disease. Under condition A, then we get monotonicity of infections. The teenagers are more likely to be infected at any point in time than my parents are. And then uh, corollary, um, which is monotonicity of caution, is that under condition A, if the fees are negative, uh, then the teenagers are gonna be less cautious than my parents are. Um, and under condition A in the knowledge case, but here we need to assume that everyone has the same uh, benefit of knowledge. So they only differ in how many meetings they have. Um, then the people, the social butterflies who have a high value of lambda uh, are going to have a higher value of caution than the, um, than the people who have few meetings. And that's because the people who have few meetings, they wanna learn this thing. They've gotta find their opportunity to learn it. And so they're gonna be desperate to take advantage of meetings even at negative values of, of eta. Sorry, I'm new. Okay, so um, two final results then on, on sorting, first for disease, and then I'll give you for knowledge. So with disease, we get positive sorting under what we think is reasonable conditions. With the exponential logit or normal distribution, this term, the first term in the, that sorting condition that involved the hazard rate, that's gonna be positive. For many distributions you, you think about, this is positive, but as I said for Pareto, this is actually equal to zero. Um, so if we've got a disease case, if we've got exponential, logit, normal, um, and then all types can be ordered in the sense that individuals who have more meetings also have a lower cost of disease. Uh, then the equilibrium has positive sorting on infection probability on lambda and on phi. Um, so infected people are more likely to match with infected people, social butterflies, social butterflies, and, and uh, low cost with low cost. In the knowledge case, um, we're going to assume that there's no heterogeneity in the benefits of, of the knowledge. Um, oh, I've written down twice. It's really important, pj equals vk. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're both positive. And now we wanna focus on, with the knowledge case, we wanna focus on negative values of nu. It's the negative values they want to accept. So we think about an exponential, which is shifted to the left. So it's minimum value is negative. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's the, that's the distributional assumption. In that case, the alphas are going to be, um, sorry, let me get this right. This, this, um, we're still gonna have the same hazard rate condition. Uh, so in that case, we get out negative sorting because of the, the flip in the sign of relationship between infection status and, and caution. Um, and so people who have a high infection probability 
are going to primarily match with people who have, or disproportionately match with people who have a low infection probability. Uh, people with a high lambda are going to disproportionately match with people with a low lambda because the low lambda people are going to put up with very negative values of nu in order to get informed when they meet a high lambda person. Okay, so let me sum up. Uh, what we've written down is a tractable model of diffusion among heterogeneous agents with a focus on how we can endogenously get sorting in that kind of model coming from the decisions of individuals about which types of matches they're, they're willing to, uh, to have. We get the, in the disease case, positive sorting arises naturally um, and negative sorting in the case of, of knowledge, both for the symmetric lack of information and for the full information case. Um, the result of that is actually in both cases, we get our homophily index to be less than one. And we have in the paper, I, don't, I left it out of the slides, we have a numerical example based on some a COVID calibration where we find this can actually have a pretty big impact on the effective reproduction number, but I put sizable in parentheses because I haven't shown you anything quantitative today. Uh, last thing is uh, efficiency. So I promised I would get back to efficiency. I'm getting back to it at the very end. Uh, so you can think about the solution to a planner's problem uh, in this environment. And there's a diffusion externality, very clear. Infected people don't care at all about getting other people infected, whether it's a good thing or bad thing to get infected. They don't benefit at all from that. Um, but one thing which is interesting uh, is that in the... Um, the, the sign of the externality, whether you want whether there's too much or too little matching that happens, actually depends on some details of the model. So, for example, in the SIR version of the model, if there's a recovered state, it could be that encouraging matches between young people early in the pandemic uh, have a low cost of disease. Uh, they actually don't match with the, each other frequently enough. You want to move them through the infected status into um, an acquired immunity status. Um, and so there's actually too few matches in, uh, between, between uh, young, healthy people in that case. So the signs of externalities are not, not totally obvious in here. Okay, so let me stop there. Okay, thank you very much for the great presentation. So uh, now we are open for a uh, you know, uh, discussion. Is there any questions? I think Bachimet had a, yeah, sorry. Uh, Bachimed had a question uh, in the Q&A window, which is, have you considered how things look in a steady state with recovery and reinfection? I guess, relatedly, right now, so we have the vaccination. Have, have you considered the exercise, including vaccinated people? So, so we, we have thought about steady state with recovery and reinfection. Um, so you know, we, we think for a lot of things, it's actually more interesting to think through the dynamics of the model. We haven't, I'd say we haven't yet seen a steady state of anything in, the, in this disease. So um, it's hard to say anything is in, is in steady state. So we think that the dynamics are, are interesting, but once you have an SIS, it's very easy to look at the, at the steady state of the disease as well. Um, and uh, so I think in the second part of the paper, right, we had the, the SIS dynamics and there we can do it. And I think we can add that back into the, the third part of the paper. On vaccination, you know, what we need is the, is the recovered, which is either acquired immunity or, um, or vaccinated immunity status uh, that, that people have. Um, and in much of the results that we have, we have worked through an SIR part. Um, and Larry Liangje could open up to say what would be the key things that we can't do at this point with a recovered state. But I'll say, I don't think anything dramatic changes in what I showed you when we add that recovered uh, state, just complicate some of the, of the analysis. So if you think about you know, what a vaccine does is just quickly move some people from S to R without having to go through the, the I state. Um, I Don't think you think it affects the information, though, if you know people are vaccinated? Yeah, so there's a question about like what information structure. Yeah, obviously, if you, you know, um, we, we have to do things either in the case where you know exactly people's health status, SI or R, or you only know their type and you know nothing about their health status. Um, we Like handling, again, the intermediate case where you don't know creates this signaling issue. And the signaling mm -hmm. issue just created... I mean, I think it's, it's very, very interesting, but it created a multiple, multiple equilibria that we 
just haven't figured out how to handle it yet. So uh, if you could have vaccinated people, you know they're vaccinated, and the other people you just you know they're not vaccinated. Yeah, we could. Um, that's probably right. We could probably work through that case. Um, or I guess you could have clubs, right, where the clubs can know who is vaccinated, who is not vaccinated. So you get sort of an like a yeah, platform so it, where people yeah, but, can but I, think, I think you're probably as long as we don't have a signaling aspect, you know, exactly what comes out of it, I can't tell you. It's, but that's probably an inter an interesting case that we could study, where you could, you know, they're either SI, you can't tell which is which, or you know that there are. Um, you could tell that. You probably break it down in arbitrary ways between different things, but that, but that one in particular we, we could study. Um, I guess with vaccination, nobody wants to meet an unvaccinated individual, right, in, including themselves. It depends I don't on know. how you go on some of the. Some, I mean, don't, don't go to the deep corners of the web. You're going to find people who are afraid of vaccinated people there. Uh, so. Yeah, that's the real world. But I guess in your model. <laughs> um, well, maybe the rationality assumption is a bit stronger than. Uh, yeah, so that's right. I mean, it would, it would be true if you could only tell someone was SI or R, and R conferred permanent immunity, um, then you would be more willing to match with R's than with um, with the people of the unknown SI status. That's certainly right. Um, and that would come out of the, of the model as well. So you would get sorting based on vaccination status as well, which, which would be interesting to see. Yeah, I think, um, Philip, your hand was up before on us. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly ask. So I find this fascinating, right? So the, the 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 work that I had on COVID where we had old and young, we kind of tagged on a little part where basically the marketplace offers at least some possibilities of separation. It was a little bit inspired by what the UK did, where they said, look, certain times only the old can go to the supermarket. The young just can't go. Right. Okay. So if you go after, you know, between seven and eight in the morning or something, only people above 70 can go. And right. so we kind of thought about, you know, what happens if part of the market is mixed and then part of the market is separated. And I'd always love to make a version where this choice might be endogenous. And we didn't, right? So I, I really welcome this. But this has a little bit of a different spirit. And I was wondering what, to which extent you think it matters whether there are marketplaces that you choose to meet up on, which is a little bit like this, you know, segmentation of markets that Jacques and Tan, Tan had a long time ago, or whether you actually kind of say, look, everybody just meets, but you know, once I met you, I I, I take a choice. Yeah, you know, and I. I think, depends, I think it's a great question. I think it depends a lot on the disease. I I feel what we're modeling may be closer to kind of an HIV dynamic. Um, you know. You can choose to go to a bathhouse in, uh, in Greenwich Village and have unprotected sex with somebody, uh, or you know, carefully seek out a partner in your uh, church group or something. You know, might be very different partners that, that you're looking for in different places. And you, you know, there it's really a deliberate decision about an act with an individual, uh, which fits closer to what we have here. I think for COVID, it's you know, do you go to a dinner party at, at your you know, friend's house? Do you invite your granddaughter over for um you know for school break or think you know these types of things there are some of that going on but there's also do you ride the subway do you go to the supermarket which have kind of you're not deliberately interacting with with a single person and i think i think both of those things were true for for covid um Ooh, so super interesting i, I think what, one question is whether is the disease transmission kind of a byproduct of what you're trying to do um or is is it some um, Let's see if I can get this right. So uh, I feel like for going to the supermarket, it's not that anyone went to the supermarket because they wanted to interact with other people. Maybe there were people who did, but for the most part, it's they you know went to the market because they need to get groceries, um, and uh, which is different than you going to a dinner party, where presumably the purpose of a dinner party is not just to eat food, but to interact with people who are at the dinner party, and that I think fits closer to what to what we have here. I think yours is in some sense a little bit, I'm not sure nicer, but certainly easier because you can make an individual choice. If you think about the the, the shopping times, right? Uh, somebody, I mean, it's not just your choice, right? You want to go yeah. to a time where nobody else goes. And it's, yeah, it's so, a little so bit maybe, trickier. maybe you also want to think that some of these things are bundles and you don't know exactly who you're going to, you, know, you get on the subway and you don't know whether it's, the car is going to be full of a bunch of young rowdy people or um, or an, an empty car. That, you know, so there's there's aren't choices exactly like that. No. So yeah, so there's elements that I think fit better for let's say some aspects of COVID 
and probably fit really well for things like um, STDs, where uh, it's you know it's clear exactly where the chance for infection is and the decision is being made. Anna, very nice. I, I like the fact that you choose whom you meet. But there are, in particular for COVID and for knowledge, I guess as well, sometimes you don't get to choose. Like if you're a parent of a high schooler, <laughs> you may want to send them to boarding school, but <laughs> that may not be feasible. So, uh, I, but I, I would imagine that your model can accommodate, say that's only, you can choose only with some probability, right? Yeah, I think I think that's. I mean, we, well, you're facing a trade. I think that's probably right. Um, and I think the let me go back to the reduced form version of it I gave, and let's think about whether that can be uh, interpretation of it. Um, where was it? I've lost myself. Yeah, so you can think about your choice of Q um, as being like a, you know the precautions that you undertake. So. You know, when your kid comes home, when your teenager comes home, do you make them wash their hands immediately, or do you? Or you can wear a face mask at home. You can. There's different things that you could do that could be increasingly unpleasant, or you know, make them live in the basement and and not talk to them uh, face to face. So those kinds of, of cues that you do could be kind of difficult things that reduce your interactions with somebody. And I think that would that's picked up kind of by by what we're uh, what we're doing here. But there's another thing which is which is kind of more or less discussing with Philip, which is also not just your teenager, it's just the accidental interactions that you have with people um, where diseases are, are transmitted. And I think that we probably need a slightly different uh, different model, I think, to pick that up. I mean, we started off thinking, some of this is an outgrowth from the NJ's job market paper. We started thinking about just the ability to start with some random meetings that you would have and then twist the distribution of who you meet at some cost. Um, and maybe that's another way to think about it. So by going to the supermarket at 6.30 in the morning, you're probably more likely to run into other, into old people, whether you're young or old, you're more likely to run into old people. Um, and so you could uh, maybe think about twisting the distribution. I think that's an approach we could go back to where other people could look at to think about kind of twisting things in, in that direction. Not, not perfectly, but distorting the distribution of who you meet. We found it, easier, kind of more direct or concrete to talk about, uh, do you actually consummate meetings with people um, into matches or not? But I think both are, are reasonable ways to think about sorting. Um, let me take Zach before Yangtze, unless uh, I'm worried yeah, about yeah. Yangtze's question. <laughs> yeah, I'll see. Uh, thanks, Rob. I was curious about, you know, thinking about the actual path of a, a disease or you know the path of knowledge or something. I mean, you know, you sort of showed this figure where you showed that the disease could kind of like speed up and slow down. And I was curious. You know, it seems like it would be a framework you could also get things like pockets of a disease, like with within a certain you know, uh, let's say age group with in the fees or like a geography. Thinking about like the heterogeneity in lambdas. Is that something you guys looked at, or you know, could you get things That's like something right? So okay. if, you, if you have, yeah. for example, the, yeah, the example I put up at the very beginning had this log norm, underlying log normal distribution. But if you have, say, two pockets, you have a high lambda group and a low lambda group, uh, then it, in the case with sorting, you're going to get an initial wave of the disease when it very quickly goes through the high lambda group. And then you're going to kind of have a pause. Um, and right. then uh, you'll get a much later takeoff for the low. So you can kind of get, get yeah. more. And then it, it seems that that's the whether, case. Then whether like, it's realistic to think it, you know, the world is that bimodal. Sure, sure. But I, I mean, I guess what I'm also thinking about is like, you know, you get some like endogenous cycles where the disease picks back up and like in the SIS model, if these agents like the young agents or the agents with high lambdas are kicked back into susceptible, you could get to where the disease comes back up and I'm trying to think in those through those cases. So, so I'm not sure if you can get it with the exponential decay. I, I mean, as a genuine, I'm not sure. If, feel, if you had something like a, uh, you know, three months of immunity uh, or something with more, more time dependence in it, uh, then it's clear you could get the, the multiple or the, you know, the repeated waves that way. Cool. So there may be, I think we're still learning exactly how long immunity lasts and you know, both acquired immunity and, and vaccinated immunity lasts in the disease. But some of it does seem to be much stronger early on and then uh, you know, phase out at, at some point, which could potentially get you multiple waves. Uh, that's right. Yang Thanks. 
Oh, no, I just want to add on to like uh, the answer to uh, Anna's question. Is like uh, there's like a probably simple extension of the model we can make it. We can assume the lambda is not a random matching technology. We basically say there are some meetings for some type of people. You have to consume it. So exogenously, this type of meeting is very big. So even if you can manipulate the queue a little bit, but there are still a lot of meetings you cannot avoid. So that's like doable. And we, we did it a little bit in a quantitative version of the model. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I guess uh, we're close to the end of the seminar because if there are no other questions, um, I think uh, that will be all. Um, let me stop recording and then. Thank you all.